Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News or our monthly housing and economy update with our friend Martin North. How are you, Martin? I'm pretty good. End of January already and uh, this is going to be a big week actually. It is, it is. Before we get to that, I just wanted to say I hope you had a good Christmas and and, and New Year. We had a a month off at the um, end of December there, guys, so you didn't miss an episode. Martin and I just both had some time off, a busy time of year and a lot of people do go on holidays, Martin. So how was your break? Yeah, not bad. Um, I sort of did a little bit, but not as much as previously. Um, and fun- funnily enough, because there were so few people around, I got quite a lot of media requests because <laughs> I was the I was the muggins who was left. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you you are getting famous these days, Martin, with everything that's happening. So good problem to have, and it's good to see you getting that recognition. Well, you know, there's a big discussion to be had about uh, the trajectory of uh, the economy and uh, households and. Uh, actually mortgages you know so there's a lot i think we need to unpack and uh, the last month has been probably a very important uh, uh, story to tell but we should also of course just cover a little bit from the previous month as well because it's really a two-month bonus edition it, it is and uh, let's uh, dive into these uh, special slides all right, so January, we're just talking before we got on that everything's had a bit of a bounce, um, you know, the, the markets, crypto, and a bit of everything. So well, what are your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, so it's very interesting. You know, the Nasdaq's up quite a lot and uh, came back a little bit today, uh, the other markets too. So the really big question which everybody's been wrestling with, is this really a turning point or is this just another dead cap bounce? In other words, a little bit of a rise, but to come back. And we often see a bit of a bounce in January. That's partly because some people get tax receipts and then they can reinvest back in the market. There's also a bit of window dressing at the end of the year when um, uh, investors, uh, particularly corporate investors, want to uh, you know, dress up their performance and their returns. But the real important leading indicator is that the results that are coming at the moment are showing considerable margin compression. In other words, it looks to me as though corporates particularly in the US and perhaps in other countries too, are going to be reporting lower results than the markets expected. Now, those will tend to put downward pressure on prices. The other thing, of course, is we've got the Federal Reserve coming out later in the week with their next decision, probably a 25 basis point hike, the Bank of Japan. We've also got uh, the Bank of England next week. We've got the Reserve Bank, of course, as well, and the Bank of New Zealand. So there's a lot of question about whether, in fact, the central banks are going to continue to lift. And at the moment, I have to say that central banks are saying, we're going to lift some more. Yeah, they are. And I'll share some thoughts on that in a second when we get to some more of these slides. But um, I think everyone from the big tech companies that are announcing these big layoffs to the um, you know, the IMF and, and all the World Bank, they're all starting to talk about this big global slowdown now and put a bit more fear out there. Yeah, and then they sort of picked up that. So the uh, you know world... Um, um, experts, you know, the people who sort of look top down saying, World Bank saying, well, maybe chance of a slowdown. And indeed, the uh, IMF also at the beginning of the year said, perhaps a third of the world economy is going to hit recession in 2023. And at the start of the year, a lot of the economists were also saying the same, that they expected to see recession, certainly in the US and, and maybe in the Eurozone. So the question now is, has thing have things turned enough to sort of take those recession fears away? But the issue I've got is that while some of the data coming out, particularly from the US, is a little bit positive, for example, unemployment is still low, wages growth is, um, you know, okay, and inflation is coming back a bit. If you look in some other places, inflationary pressures are still very, very strong, and most people in real terms continue to go backwards in terms of income and that essentially means they've got less to spend if they have less to spend then perhaps they're going to actually just uh, be a little bit more um you know concerned about where they spend that money but china of course (laughs) big change there too with regards to the uh the the covid situation so they're they're reopening and so people are now hanging their hat on china as perhaps avoiding some of those recessionary things so there are so many Cross currents, but it is an interesting observation that many people are still betting on a recession in at least parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, the Bank of Canada, they've been one of the more aggressive ones in this chart here. Well, this is quite interesting because the Bank of Canada came out last week with their last rate rise. Last because that's what they've said. They said they're going to pause for the moment. Now, that's a very interesting 
sort of signal because they've been leading the charge a little bit. And so the question is, does this give us a little bit of a sense of what other central banks are going to do? In other words, move up to a certain level and then just pause. But they did say the reason they're pausing is because it takes 12 to 18 months for the impact of those rate rises to hit, which is a very important observation. So they've been making decisions without seeing the impact of their past decisions. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some other central banks beginning to say, well, okay, we might have to pause a bit. But pausing is not the same as cutting. And at the moment, what's interesting is that the markets generally are taking a much more bullish view that they're going to cut sooner than the central banks are actually saying themselves. So there's a really big divergence now between what the central banks are actually saying they're going to do, which is rates will stay high into 2023 and probably in 2024, and what the markets are saying. And there's an old little um, phrase about don't bet against the Fed because the Fed is still saying, no, no, we've got to put rates up higher and we've got to keep them there for a period. They don't want to make the same mistake that they made in the 70s when they took rates down too soon and then created more inflation, that which took the, uh, the story to, into another chapter. So Bank of Canada potentially could be a leading indicator of what uh, the playbook looks like. But it doesn't necessarily mean that rates are going to get cut anytime soon. Yeah, and I find it interesting how we've spoken about this in past episodes, the Fed and the RBA and whatnot are, are sort of talking tough, but then someone like Canada, because they're all so um, you know, co-linked, intermingled, they're all going to end up doing basically the same thing. And so how can the Bank of Canada that's next door to the US say, hey, we're paused and then over the road next week or, the, or this week, sorry, the Fed are probably going to say committed to higher for longer again? Yeah, and that's the that's the dilemma I think that many uh, central banks are, are, are facing. Of course, the problem is the exchange rate gets out of out of whack if you don't follow suit, and, and so it's actually the international flows that are actually driving a lot of the decisions that are being taken, as well as domestic issues. And really, if you look at the Bank of Canada situation, their inflation there is potentially easing a little. But if you look at Japan, which is another central bank that's going to make a decision, their inflation is raging. So they've got a four-decade high inflation in Japan. Remember that Japan has been artificially suppressing interest rates for quite a long period of time. So that now begs the question as to whether Japan is going to have to lift rates. Are they going to have to change monetary policy? And uh, in, a, in a couple of months' time, they're going to change the, the head of the Bank of Japan. That might signal a change. So there are so many moving parts to this story. Yeah, our last episode we did um, on, on our channel, Martin, was all about Japan and the situation there and how interesting oh. it is and how so often we become um, US-centric focused. But I really think so many of these other countries are, are going to kind of start to do this more protectionist take where they're doing whatever they can to defend their own currency or protect their own economy and, and jobs. Uh, and that's where things are going to get um, more volatile, I think, with currencies and bonds that's true. I mean, we discussed last time, and it's still true. The the yen has been, you know, significantly depreciated, and that puts a lot of uh, pressures on the local economy as well as the international flows. Yes. But if you go to the Fed, it's very interesting. They have started their quantitative easing. So the assets peaked in um, April uh, with um, about eight point nine trillion. It's come back a little, but not much, but a little, right? But the Fed is still talking about actually hiking rates further. But the other side of the coin in the US is that the Treasury have actually been injecting liquidity into the markets. <laughs> so you've almost got this, this shadow Fed entity, the Treasury, doing things almost pulling in the opposite direction. And of course, what they've now got in the US is this debt ceiling problem. So they've got this legislated maximum they can get to, about $31 trillion. They're knocking on the door of it now, and in a few months, that's going to become a really big issue. So it's fascinating to see the Fed and the Treasury potentially pulling in two directions and now starting to wrestle with the debt ceiling question. And, you know, we know previously, because I've had a few of these in the past, it tends to run up to the deadline and then there's a sort of some sort of compromise. Yeah. But some in the US are suggesting that this time the debt ceiling problem is going to be a bigger question because ultimately it will stop the Biden administration doing what, what they want to do um, unless the Treasury finds some backdoor route to be able to actually put more liquidity into the system as the Fed tightens. <laughs> I have no idea how this is going to play out because you've got these two entities now not necessarily on the same page. 
Yeah, and for those that haven't been in, in the market for too long, this debt ceiling chat comes up every couple of years and it's always the same. There's the, the doom and gloom headlines and then they always um, you know, in, in, agree to increase it. I think they're one of the only countries that even has this talk of debt ceiling and others just, just, just let it go. But the other interesting thing you said then, Martin, was how they've become a... Um, a shadow Fed and they've picked up the slack um, as the actual Fed is starting to tighten. And of course, we know Janet Yellen um, is now the treasurer who was the former head of the Fed. So shadow Fed indeed. Yeah, a very, very interesting time. So watch the US. I think that the interest rate decision this week could well determine the future tra trajectory of the markets. I think they've been overdone. I think the markets have reacted too strongly to the first uh, month of the year. I think we're going to see more weakness ahead. And, uh, you know, Morgan Stanley, for example, are still saying that uh, they think the markets will be lower at the end of the year rather than higher. So interesting to see. Anyway, let's come across to Australia because, you know, the Australian situation is quite interesting because the RBA is going to make a decision. They've been on holiday for, uh, for January, so, you know, eight weeks since the last one. Um, the employment data is still pretty strong, um, surprisingly strong, actually. But there was some number wanging going on in those numbers. And in fact, the um, uh, the ABC, when they made an article, said shock job losses in December drives unemployment to 3.5%. So there were some things going on. Firstly, the thing to understand about the way the unemployment numbers are done, they're actually done on a sampling basis and they change the samples each time. Well, the samples that were actually brought in had a different set of employment data relative to the previous set. So some of this is statistical number weighing. But the other point is that we've still got a fairly um, strong story in terms of jobs, so jobs growth there, but there are more people excluded from the workforce at the moment. And uh, some would say that perhaps the, the job list number really isn't telling the full story, which is quite interesting because if you then compare it with Roy Morgan, for example, who have a different measure of unemployment, what there is saying is that unemployment is quite a lot stronger because there are more people looking for work and it's a bigger number. So maybe the official story on the unemployment rate doesn't give us the full story. Yeah, I agree. And we've spoken about how those numbers um, have, have changed and how they're measured o over the years. But I think um, it, it's really that wages growth stuff that you're talking about and how how quickly that's going to... And I think that's where I'm waiting to see. I, I really think that the higher mortgage repayments and all the, those things that are coming down um, the pipeline, as well as the cost of living pressures, I think we're just waiting to see now how hard it's going to hit the lower class and probably the middle oh. class. But I'm still... Yep. I still sort of have this picture in the back of my mind where they're going to be easing and the wealthy that are forward looking are going to look to come in and scoop up all these assets um, and whether or not that easy money and just the pivot in terms of sentiment and go, well, that's, is that the worst that inflation is going to get for the next 10, 20, 30 years and people really look to start to outlay um, again aggressively? So that's kind of what I've got in my head at the moment, Martin. Yeah, well, but the unemployment, you know, the unemployment is one thing, but the CPI is another thing. And the CPI number came out, all right, 7.8%. That was higher than expected. Again, there's some number wanging in there because they changed some of the weightings. But the trimmed mean at 6.9%, that's as high as it's been for, for, you know, for a long, long time. So it's clear to me that the inflation number is, is not where people expected it to be. So as a result of that, pretty much everyone is now saying the RBA is likely to do 0.25% next week, and that's probably right. The question is, of course, what do they do beyond that? Now, there are some people saying, well, maybe that's it. Others are saying maybe there will be a couple more rate rises. Um, there's almost nobody now saying they're going to start cutting very soon. But again, the markets, the markets are still saying, well, maybe later in, in the year they'll start cutting. But I have a feeling that it's going to take quite a lot longer to get this inflation thing under control. And some of the inflation is being imported because we've still got, um, you know, energy prices continue to rise and there's more, more rises coming through there. We've got significant rises in food prices. They're very, you know, up, up quite a lot, although there's been a few movements because of some of the, um, the floods receding and things like that. So when you look at real household flows, they are still extreme relative to where they were and you know the latest research would suggest <laughs> compared with a year ago the first month of the year you're basically just working to cover the extra costs of the things you bought last year so you know <laughs> there's no you know going forwards yeah. but then you make a very important point alex and that is that you've got this diversion so there are some people who are doing really well and have got plenty of um buffers and they will be able to survive this fine but there's a lot of people who haven't and aren't 
And all of the statistics, if you look at um, uh, those reaching for food banks, those reaching for debt counselling, uh, those reaching for more um, credit, they're all up. And there's a very significant concentration, about a third of households, who are really caught now in this bear trap between high CPI, no real wages growth, and, of course, the mortgage problem, which we'll come on to as well. So, yeah, there is a real diversity. And unfortunately, I feel the politicians sometimes forget about the one-third of Australians who are really doing it tough. Yeah, and things we've both spoken about in the past as well is that the the wealth gap. And so you think about when the cost of living goes up 8% over a year, all those people that are living pay, check to paycheck, for example, and almost... You know, we hear these different stats about what percentage of people have a thousand dollars for an emergency and whatnot. So they're now eight percent underwater. Whereas those people, their boss, who have got um, you know a thousand percent higher wage, it, they don't really even notice it when their um, their supermarket no. bills and cost of living goes up eight percent. So I guess that's just one another way I'd like people to think about it um, at home. And if you look at the non-discretionary versus discretionary, right, that's quite interesting because the non-discretionary, that's the stuff you have to spend money on, you know, food and fuel, 8.4%, right? Whereas the discretion is at 7.1%. So once again, if you've actually got a bit more, um, you know, money floating around the place, you can weather this storm fine. But if you are up against it, 8.4% is a huge impost, huge impost. And that's why many people are really finding it quite difficult. They're having to do extra hours, extra jobs. They're cutting back on their spending. They're spending uh, differently, you know, going to uh, perhaps smaller shops or uh, going to discount shops to try and actually extend it. But it is really tough for many people. All right. So this um, house price decline, is this now the fastest uh, ever, Martin, or...? Yeah, pretty much. It depends where you look. Brisbane, for example, never never seen such a significant fall. And this is the core logic numbers. Um, you know, they're showing significant drops. And interestingly, the most recent updates they've just released showing is showing now that there are falls in Perth and Adelaide. So everybody is seeing significant falls, and it's happening quickly. Why? Because, of course, interest rates have gone up very significantly, much quicker than ever before. And as you and I have discussed on several previous shows, the most significant lever in terms of house prices is availability of credit. Credit availability is a problem now because essentially um, borrowing power is reduced by up to 30% for many people. In other words, you can't get such a big mortgage as previously. And that means that uh, whilst prices are coming down a bit, Borrowing power is actually um, shrinking even more, and that then puts people in a terrible position because it means that they can't actually get into the market. We're also seeing listings um, a little bit down, a little bit up, a uh, few more coming on now, but the total volume of throughput is still quite low. And I don't see any end to these price falls. I know everybody, everybody in the real estate sector is spruiking the interest rate cuts. Not sure they're going to come anytime soon. They're spruiking the migration. Well, maybe that will increase some demand, but probably for rental in the short term. But what that means is we're going to see prices significantly slide towards where they were before the COVID peak. And in fact, in some areas of Brisbane, prices now have come back to where they were before that COVID acceleration. So we saw a massive rise of, what, 20% or more. That was because of ultra low interest rates and all the government stimulus and everything else. Well, that's now unwinding. And just remind you that before the COVID peak, prices were still horrible relative to income. And they went even worse, so they're coming back. So it's not like we're getting a correction back to sustainable levels yet. I think there's more further falls ahead. Yeah, and that's what this um, mortgage cliff that everyone's talking about, these um, projected expiries of the fixed rate loans, and we see that really jumping up um, in the next two, three quarters. Yeah, and in fact, uh, the, you know, the, the June-July period in particular is going to be a big deal. And uh, there's going to be a lot of people who will be on 2% mortgages and suddenly find themselves on 6%. Some of them are planning ahead. Some of them are putting more money ahead of time, but many aren't. Many are just assuming she'll be right. Well, maybe they won't be. And that means that your mortgage repayments will be up significantly. When I mean significantly, it could be 60 70 80 90% higher than currently. And that is going to be a big impost on, on many people. Uh, the question is, of course, whether those fixed rates will come back a little bit because of those forward expectations or not. But at the moment, it's not looking good for people on fixed rate mortgages. And the middle of the year is going to be a real crunch point. 
Yeah, so as you said, there's a third of um, mortgages having to refinance this year. Yeah, this was a survey that was uh, done quite recently by Mortgage Choice, and they said a lot of people are trying to refinance. Why? Well, firstly, because they're trying to actually get onto a better rate, and uh, a lot of people still don't have the very best rate they could get, so that's helping to alleviate some of it. But also what people are doing is refinancing and releasing equity. So there's about 90 billion of equity that's been pulled out from properties over the last 12 months or so as people have refinanced. Now, that's a very significant support to the economy. But of course, what you're doing is you're eating into your equity at the time when property prices are falling. So it, it's a short-term strategy, but you can't keep doing it. And so the question is, will people actually come unglued when in fact the value of their property slides and they're suddenly where they can't grab any more equity? What do they do then? Because they're not changing their behavior in terms of spending patterns. What they're doing is grabbing that extra credit or even using buy now, pay later, which uh, is going to be regulated more ahead or uh, credit cards. So there's a lot of people relying on debt and more debt and refinancing their way out of this. But that not necessarily is a very sustainable strategy. Yeah, and I think I saw that uh, bank shares, uh, was it CBA, hitting all-time highs. Yep. So it's Absolutely. really um, not what you'd expect if there's a housing <laughs> crash on the horizon in terms of the Australian big banks that are so exposed to mortgages and, and whatnot um, making record highs. So, hey, as a contrarian, maybe that's um, something to look to go the other way. Well, it is interesting. So the banks are doing quite well at the moment. Um, their margins are being, are being compressed. They're actually saying they're fighting very hard for... Uh, for that refinancing and you know as i said seeking better rates if you look at the external refinancing that was in the abs numbers um that's the only growth area so essentially new credit is growing at a slower rate than previously the latest uh, numbers is coming out today i haven't looked at them yet from apra and from the rba i'm interested to see where the credit is going but the external refinancing was up that's because people are now quite desperate to try and actually find a way through this. That means the banks are competing very hard. In some cases, the banks are not even doing fresh underwriting appraisals. They're taking the previous bank's appraisal and just swapping it across, which is a problem because, of course, many financial footprints will have changed. So refinancing is a big deal. I think we're going to see more of it. Uh, a lot of people who can refinance are actually being able to uh, get better rates. But there are also now people who are stuck so they're mortgage prisoners. They can't refinance on a better rate because their finances are not um, looking very flash or their loan-to-value ratios are wrong. So the banks are being a bit more choosy. And what that is doing is them putting pressure on some sectors rather than others and some banks rather than others. But at the moment, you know, I think the banks are actually probably overvalued and quite significantly. Okay. So you've got some more stats here um, in terms of credit growth. Yeah, so this is just the um, up to last month and just showing that credit for both owner-occupied and investment um, and overall housing is now easing down. I expect to see that continuing. So in other words, the momentum in terms of new lending is definitely off. It's refinancing and that's just sort of moving you know, it around within the system. It's not actually creating additional credit other than the um, equity withdrawal. So expect to see more credit uh, growth slows. And that, of course, is very significant because the profitability of the banks are determined by growth in credit. If credit is growing more slowly, profitability is more under pressure. All right, new loan commitments? Yeah, so this is just, uh, again, from the um, from the ABS showing that, in fact, the Volume is down quite considerably, most significant falls for quite some time. Again, another leading indicator of potentially more issues ahead in terms of both credit availability. And I've said credit availability drives home prices. When credit is less available, prices fall. So there's probably more likelihood of prices falling ahead. And, uh, you know, the ABS statistics sort of reinforces that trajectory, I think. Yes, a house is only worth what a, a bank is willing to lend. <laughs> Unfortunately. And of course, first time buyers, well, they're checking out. So the uh, data on first time buyers is significantly lower, uh, as you can see there from its peak um, end of last year. And, um, you know, what's fascinating about all of this is that the story for first time buyers, and I made a, a short on this, I'm, I'm issuing a few shorts on my channel, is that this borrowing power question relative to price falls and relative to what's called the housing household expenditure measure, in other words, how they calculate the uh, amount that you can afford, right? So basically, because of inflation, the amount that you can actually afford is going down. Because of the 
um, rise in interest rates, the borrowing power, plus 3%, of course, from APRA, means you can borrow less. But both of those are actually stronger numbers than the fall in prices. So, in fact, net-net, first-time buyers are in this terrible dilemma where they're watching prices fall, but they're watching their ability to get into the market fall further. And that's a big deal. And I've spoken to a number of first-time buyers in the last couple of months who are really struggling now because they've got a reasonable deposit saved, but they still can't get into the market. And unless prices drop dramatically further, and perhaps this is where they're going to head, they can't really get into the market. So this is a real big deal at the moment. Yeah, and, and that's where I see that possibly investors are going to have more capital behind them to come in and, and swoop up these house price corrections that then the foot that the first home buyer has to stand on because of the other costs of living and their wages and we might see unemployment rise and all that other thing. It's all going to work against them, um, creating this bigger wealth gap. Yeah, and in fact, if you look at real wages, it's worth just reflecting again that real, 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 real wages, that's after inflation, is going to continue to fall. So people are going to continue to go backwards in real terms, uh, and that's going to put pressure on renters as well as uh, property purchases and those with a mortgage. So at the moment, you know, the question then is, well, in that context, how can there not be some recessionary forces coming back into the economy? You know, and, and perhaps the markets have over exit at the moment. So that's what I'm looking at, and I think that we're going to see quite a lot of difficulties as we move into the rest of 2023. All right, a million mortgage holders um, at risk of this stress and uh, extreme stress, Matt Martin. Yes, so this is the Roy Morgan data that came out uh, just the other day. And, and what they're saying is that mortgage stress, they define it in a very particular way in terms of you know, relative income, going to the mortgage and those sorts of things. But it, it's up and it's, and it's growing. And they think that as rates rise further, it's going to be a more significant factor. So not everyone's going to fall over tomorrow, but this mortgage stress number is 1.1 million now. That's a big number, 23.9% of households on their basis. Now, of course, that's a different method that I use. So when I define stress, I actually define it in cash flow terms, so money in, money out. And at the moment, if you look at my data, then both rental stress is up. Mortgage stress is about 45% of households in cash flow terms. In other words, people are in negative territory in terms of money in, money out. And that's um, a bigger number than I've seen for quite some time. So whether you take my numbers or whether you take Roy Morgan's numbers, there are a lot of households who are doing it tough at the moment. Yeah, that's a huge jump in that um, rental stress as well, which we've, we've spoken about how a lot of those property owners are, are putting up um, the rents because of how tight the market is and it gives them more of a buffer with the banks and a lot of the banks have asked for the owners to possibly get ahead of those rate rises um, by increasing their rents. So that's gone up and stayed up. Absolutely. Yeah, rental stress is a real big issue. You know, rental availability is a real problem. People are having to bid sometimes to get a, a place to, to live. And then the investors put up the rents again and uh, that's just putting more pressure on everybody. But also the other factor is interesting. With those interest rate rises going up, the rental is not necessarily going up strong enough to cover all the extra costs. So a lot of property investors are still underwater in cash flow terms. And if there's no capital growth in the property, then why would you hold on to the property? And that's why we're seeing more ex-investment properties coming on as listings. So quite often lesser quality properties haven't been maintained very well. Quite a few of those are coming on the market at the moment. So that's telling you something about the mix of property that's available in the market as well. So there's a lot of um, you know worrying signs in all of this, I think. Yeah, and I guess um, another thing just for people at home to note is that um, when we have the uh, interest rates going up and you can get the higher rates in the savings account or on government bonds, corporate bonds, junk bonds, whatever, it's, well, realistically, what are the rental yields if we're not looking at strong capital growth, um, if we're not going to go back into the same backdrop that we've had for the past 30 or 40 years, you know, the, all the risk and the maintenance costs of a property versus just having that money in the savings account, that's when a more bearish scenario where we'd see the market flooded with more properties and rental properties and all that type of thing. Mm, absolutely. Well, you know, you can get 4% plus in term deposits at the moment. It's very hard to make a 4% return on uh, on investment property um, in net terms, uh, even with, you know, tax offsets and what, what's, what things like that, if there's no capital appreciation. And at the moment, my modelling is saying it's unlikely to see capital appreciation in the next two or three years. Yeah, interesting. Chris Joy also um, had an article saying that 
the times have changed and he's been one of the biggest bulls for so long. So even he's saying, I don't think he's super bearish, but I think he's saying, yeah, you know, sideways, we're not going to see the same crazy growth we saw over recent decades. No, I don't think we're going to see that. I think that was a one-off. That was an aberration. That was taking uh, interest rates way too low. Government policy was to stimulate the markets and use the property sector. Um, some of those things are coming in blue. And in fact, you look at my scenarios. I run three scenarios. My my best case scenario is that rates stay at around 3.1 and uh, then we find that you know things drift a little bit easier later on. The base case, though, is rates go to 3.65%, which means that mortgage rates will be somewhere between 6 and 7% for people, and they're going to stay high through most of 2023. Inflation will stay above target probably until next year, but there's no recession in Australia. The worst case scenario, though, is that we see those rates going even higher. We actually get recessionary forces hitting Australia. They then cut rates, but wages growth stalls, and uh, you know it doesn't really help. So if you then take those three scenarios and translate it, you can see that my sort of scenarios for houses and units are that on the best case, they go sideways for the next um, two or three years, right? These accumulative numbers. But the base case is there's a further downside, maybe 10 or 15%. Uh, and the worst case is what could be even worse. You know, we could be seeing 25 or 30% down. And interestingly, if you look at long terms, um, affordability and in income ratios, then that worst case scenario would begin to get properties back to a more normal affordability level. So I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm saying that it's hard to see a growth story for property from this point, even in the best case scenario. Mm. Uh, even in that base case, Martin, I, I would argue that if we get rates at 3.6 and mortgages at 6 or 7 for you know, the best part of 12 months, I even think we'd probably have a recession. So... Um, yeah, this is, this is my thoughts on that. And the final slide you've got here, I think we touched on this before. It's just crazy how wrong the RBA and all central bankers have been and at um, the least the list they're saying sorry. Yeah, look, I mean, he isn't really, but he said, I'm sorry if people listen to what I said. And, and it's interesting, of course, because the review currently is underway with regard to the RBA and, uh, you know, how they do their monetary policy. That's coming out, I think, in March. And now there's a bit of discussion as to whether um, the governor will... Uh, you know, get a renewal of his um, a contract or not. Um, but the real question is, how are they making decisions? How good is their forecasting? Their forecasting has been pretty off. So what's changed? How, should we have any more confidence in what they're saying now compared with what they were saying a little while ago? Against the backcloth, of central banks around the world continuing to lift rates for a period of time, financial markets bullish at the moment, but potentially perhaps too bullish and, and coming back. And locally, the, you know, the pressures on households being um, a significant issue. Now, we do have a couple of positives. And that is, of course, that the China story is one of perhaps opening up, and that could actually put uh, a bit of a floor on uh, some of those uh, export prices for some of our resources. Um, and maybe we're going to get uh, an influx of uh, Chinese um, students coming back because they can't do remote now. So you know, there are a few things that are actually working for us as well, and we're probably better placed than many other economies. But I have to say, I don't mark the central bank very good at all over the last few years. I think they've stuffed up majorly. I'm trying to cover up some of that um, ish stuff up, I think. But uh, it's a real problem. So I have no confidence in the central bank at the moment. And, uh, you know, whatever that report comes out uh, like in a few weeks' time, um, the critical question is how do we get a better basis for monetary policy ahead? I think we probably need a different leadership team. Well, Martin, I'm glad to hear you're doing um, YouTube shorts as well with everything that's happening. There's plenty of content that you're pumping out to keep everyone up to date. And guys, those links are always um, down below. But Martin, thanks for another great monthly update and uh, we'll see you again next month. See you then. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks, guys.